hope that your week was a blessed one. And moms, I can tell you, it was a good one, not complaining. So, give thanks that you're here this morning. Amen. Your word. Amen. And your word tells us that every day that we open up our eyes and we can see each other is that we have received new mercies. Isn't mercy a wonderful thing? Especially when it's coming from God. Okay? So, let us pray, giving thanks to God. Our Father, we truly want to thank you this morning for another day that you have blessed us with. We recognize that your goodness towards us, Father, is there always. You're a faithful God. Even when we're not faithful, you remain faithful. Your word tells us that you will never, ever leave us nor forsake us. These words are comfort to those who know you because we know if God is for us, then who can be against us? And so, Father, this morning, Lord, as we would gather like this in your presence to offer a praise to you, telling you thanks for all that you have done for us, it is because of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made this possible for us to be here this morning. And so, Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you for all that you have done. And as we would continue, Father, to listen to your voice, O oh God, we will be obedient to you. And so, God, we ask that you may bless those who are participating this morning in this service, O oh God. And for those who are here who do not know you, we, Lord, pray that you may grant unto them a special invitation, Father, to come to you. And I pray that by this morning, Lord, that they will recognize their needs for you. So, O oh God, we commit the meeting to you and we commit everyone that is here this morning. And I pray that you may receive our thanks, O oh God, as we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And the congregation say, Amen. Amen. So, uh, we will look at some upcoming events. And um, we had our Sunday school this morning, and the ladies did have theirs at the back. This morning, David introduced us to a new topic, and I think that it is going to be very, very interesting. And for those who are not coming to Sunday school, I know it can be challenging in the morning to get up a little bit early. You know, challenging for me, but I'm still here. You know, at least I try to be early. You know, <laughs> Lee's laughing because, you know, he knows, you know, I'm always coming in after everyone is seated. But please come because David has a, a vast amount of knowledge. And, you know, in the past I have listened to him and I have learned a lot. You know, I thought I knew a lot before I came here, but. I throw all that out. You know, I, not, I shouldn't say I throw it all out, but you know, it's there's a vast amount of knowledge here. Pastor is there. David is there. You know, we are. Stanley is here. Come. Yes. <laughs> but just come. Enjoy the teaching. It is rich and it is good for you. Okay? So get up out of your bed and come on down. Alright? So, um, today is Sunday, and for those, Sunday, November the 12th, right? And for those who are celebrating um, birthday, we say happy birthday to you all. And if you're not, if you're coming for the first time, or you haven't come for a while, okay, we welcome you. And I see a hand pointing on Bob, and I know that today is birthday. <laughs> So we want to wish Bob a happy birthday. And if you don't mind, you can sing happy birthday. Are we allowed to do that faster? Okay, so let's stand and sing happy birthday to Bob. After two, one, two. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. I just want to 
to say thank you, and you made an old man feel happy. All right. <laughs> and we are glad that we were able to do that for you this morning. Okay, so um, upcoming event, just remember, um, Tuesday, November 14th at 10 a.m., it says that Moms and Munchkin. And um, oh, Tuesday... Oh, actually, it's been moved to Monday. 21st. Yeah. Sorry. So you heard that from the mom, one of the mom. 21st. Yeah. Okay. And Tuesday, uh, November 14th at 6 p.m., it's our grief share in ministry. Tuesday, November the 21st, there is a type of seminar, grief, um, grief share uh, seminar, and our brother John will be conducting that. And now we are going to be reading Call to Worship. And the passage that we're going to be reading from is Psalms 31, verse 5, and we are required to stand for the reading of his word. So let us read together Psalms 31 verse 5. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. You may. Thank you. You may be seated. And I am so sorry about you guys having the exercise this morning by getting <laughs> It is good for your heart. Okay? So I want to ask you a question. Uh, 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 a question. Why are you here this morning? And it's not a rhetorical question. You know, why are you here this morning? God is worthy of our prayer. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I want to sing this chorus if you will allow me, and I want you to, you know, to just to join with me. You know, it's just a, a simple chorus, few lines, and it goes like this. I just came to praise the Lord. Come on. I just came to praise the Lord.
it's a beautiful song. And, you know, sometimes we make mistakes with this song, but this morning we won't, right? <laughs> Let us sing.
Lord, we pray that you'll be with him and be with Henry and whichever member of the family happens to be tending him at any one given moment. Uh, right at the moment, it's Henry. Uh, we ask patience there. But we ask some answers uh, from doctors and uh, get him on the right track. Uh, most of all, we ask there for salvation. Uh, what we understand, he does not know you. And when you live in a health situation that is at best precarious, to not have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. is a scary thing. So enlighten him, Lord. Let him open his heart to you. Let him open his heart to the gospel of Christ and receive salvation. We ask your blessing on the things going on here this morning. We, we pray your blessing on each and every person here, each component of our service, the music, everything we do. Let it all be to your honor and your glory. And at this moment, we take the time to uh, stop everything else and take just a few minutes to return to you a portion of what you have blessed us with. You, Lord, are such a great and giving God, and you give us so much. Let us honor you appropriately with our gifts as we return to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Pastor Sean, being the Marine, gets to do the, uh, the message. This year, he thought he was going to have other things on his mind this weekend. I, I don't know what that might have been. Maybe six, six and a half pounds or something like that. And uh, so he was wise enough to kind of bail out and he asked Lee if he would take over the Sunday morning. And uh, Lee gets the opportunity to take the final piece of this wonderful narrative of Stephen's defense. This is the capstone of the narrative. And Steve, we've spoken about it, and I just can't wait. Can't wait to hear what he has to say. About it. So Lee, I was hoping that was going to get long enough to get this up and running. <laughs>
And when Moses came and he led them out of the land, where did they rejoice that God had provided them this Savior? No, they rejected Moses' leadership. And because of their actions, they had to spend years in the desert. They had to suffer the bites of snakes. They had to eat manna, which he got tired of, so then he choked them on birds. In every step of the way, they were fighting, fighting against God and God's leader, appointed leader Moses. Moses had to defend get them against what they were doing and tell God, please, don't destroy them. Then there's the idolatry. Moses is up, communing with God, getting the tablets that contain the Ten Commandments. And what were they doing? Melting down their gold and making an idol, a cow. Because they needed to have something to worship. God wasn't enough for them. They wanted a physical representation. And even when they became a nation, they worshipped all the foreign gods. They had a worship. Sacrificing their children. Throwing them into pits of fire. Yes, that one hurts when you think about the current debate on abortion in our country. We still have this sin with us. And then, even the temple itself became an idol. The priests that were standing up against Stephen and condemning him, they were more concerned about their position of authority and the temple than the good news. They confined God to a temple. They wanted to be the authority in the community. They were fearful of the loss of that authority, the loss of a position the honor of their position. And they rejected the Messiah. The very Messiah that had been promised for hundreds and hundreds of years that they've looked forward to, they didn't recognize him when he was standing right there in front of their face. They rejected that Messiah, they condemned him to death, and they murdered him on the cross. And even when he comes back, he's resurrected, says, I am still alive. I have conquered death. They still were fighting against these people who were going out and giving out the good news. Stephen was telling them. But like our men's group, when we're studying Matthew, Matthew, the, the story of the feast and the leader who went and sent the people, his people out to gather the, the chosen people to the feast, they refused to come. So now Stephen and others were going out and they were gathering all the people on the roads, gathering them in. If my people will not come to me, then I will go find others who will come to me. And this is what angered them, I think, more than anything. That they are being accused of killing a Messiah. But they didn't want this Messiah. They wanted a king, a conquering king. They were looking for a Messiah who's going to rule from earth, take David's throne, kick out the Romans, and establish the kingdom on earth. But Jesus wasn't that. He was establishing the kingdom of heaven, a greater kingdom that we all had a part of. In the end, Stephen throws the pot of oil into the flames. He says, it's not me who's blasphemy. It is you who have rejected the Holy Spirit, the law, and God himself. You are the ones who are blasphemy. And that leads us up to where we are today. But before we read this passage, let's take a moment to pray. Dear God, as we read about this and this capsule, this end of Stephen's life, and how, how he holds himself in this moment of trial. Open our hearts. Let us self-examine. Let us determine where we stand in our relationship to you. Are we standing as Christ would? Are we following the example of Stephen? Following the words and actions of Jesus? Or do we still have work to go? And if we do have work, if we do have room for, for growth, 
allow us to see where it is and take the actions necessary so that we can mature in our Christianity. We ask this in your son's holy name. Amen. Would you please stand for the reading of the word. Acts 7, verses 54 to 60. The stoning of Stephen. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Praise be to God for his holy word. Amen. It is a short passage, but it has a lot of depth into it. In particular, what does he say at this time when his life is being taken? Is his thinking about himself in any way? No. His eyes are firmly fixed on Jesus. Some of the things that really stuck out as I studied this was the first phrase. Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. One of the things I discovered was, in the New Testament, 80 times Jesus Christ calls himself the Son of God. I mean, Son of Man, excuse me. He calls himself the Son of Man, establishing that he is man. He is human, mm -hmm. as well as holy God. Yet, this is the only time I found in the New Testament where anyone else referred to Jesus as the Son of Man. Many mentions in the Old Testament, but the only time in the New Testament. This would be particularly infuriating to the Pharisees, Sadducees, those who were judging him. Because they had not come to the concept of the Trinity. Again, something they pointed to today's Sunday school. Please come to Sunday school. It's great. Great for us all. They didn't have this concept. They were looking for something different. Mm -hmm. And to say that a man, a man that they had killed, was now standing in heaven at the right side of God, a position of authority, would have just infuriated them past the boiling point. Gnashing their teeth. But then there's also the other two things that Stephen says. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I'm fully convinced Stephen was there at the cross as one of the followers of Christ. Because this was the very thing Christ was saying. He says, God, receive, Father, receive my spirit as he was dying. And then he thinks, and he thinks the other thing that Christ did on the cross was, do not condemn them for they know not what they do. He tries to absolve them of the sin of the crucifixion itself. And Stephen looks up in this vision of Jesus and says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. He's not condemning them personally. And he doesn't want them condemned on his account. The accusations he had were accusations from God, not from Stephen himself. He was following Christ as yet. He loved and he wanted people to convert. At the very end of this, I'll mention one of them in particular who was there. <coughs> but then, at the end, after he said this, he fell asleep. He passed on. 
So how does a person in the face of stoning, of the face of being killed for his belief, of the face of doing what God, Jesus Christ, had asked him to do, how do they get that, that core strength? He's a young man. By all accounts, he was born in 5 AD, which was about 30 years of age. Young by our standards. He is certainly younger than a lot of the priests. But can you imagine at 30 years old going through this and how you'd react? We have young people here who I know are facing trials and facing having to make those hard conversations with friends and co-workers and family. And they aren't jerking away from it. I commend them on that. Not everybody would be able to do so in the threat of their very lives. So how does he get this? I believe... That's because he is standing on the shoulders of giants. Giants who had come before him. Isaiah. Isaiah who had more than any other prophet described the nature and coming of the Messiah. Isaiah who had spoken on God's behalf until he was martyred. Sawn in half inside a law. One of the most gruesome accounts I've read. Then there's Jeremiah. Jeremiah stood up in a very horrible time, a time when the Jewish nation was about to be enslaved and taken away from their country. And he spoke the words he was given, and eventually, in the end, he was stoned to death. Ezekiel. Ezekiel, in captivity, spoke on God's behalf, spoke the words that were given to him, and he was again stoned by his own people. And Daniel, Daniel who most accurately and exactly told them exactly what was going to happen with the coming of the Messiah, exactly what was going to happen, what it was going to look like. Daniel didn't die, but it wasn't for lack of effort. Remember, he was thrown to the lions. I don't know if he had catnip in his pocket or literally <laughs> Jesus came down and protected him, but he survived that. So it's not like you're always going to face your death standing for God, but you have to be prepared for the possibility. These were giants, but they were also sons of man. What does that term even mean? It means that they were sons of Adam. Okay. That they were of man. Jesus was telling them, I am a son of man. I am man. He was also fully God. These prophets... God used them, but they were still men, and they also had their own faults. Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, verse 4. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him and called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal they had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So here, Isaiah realized that he was unworthy to be the spokesperson for God. And God says, I'll send my servant and I'll absolve you of your sins, clean your lips so that you may serve as my prophet. <coughs> Jeremiah. The call of Jeremiah. <laughs> now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, And Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go, says God. And wherever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the word. And God basically gives the words, touches Jeremiah's mouth, and gives him the words to speak. 
So we should not be afraid to stand and proclaim the word of God. Do not be afraid that you're not, not going to know what to say at the appointed time. Because God will be there and will give you the words. Ezekiel 2 to 6. In Ezekiel 2 to 6. And you, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions, be not afraid of the words, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a belly's house. And you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I look, behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of book was in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back, and there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. Again, Ezekiel, unsure of himself, what he is going to say, and he says, God gives him the scroll to eat, give him some words to give. And, and in his another acknowledgement that he is a son of man, but he is speaking on behalf of God against a rebellious nation. When you see sin, it is on you as a Christian to point it out among your brothers, among your family, among your workers. If we just allow the sin to continue, the nation continues to degrade. The nation continues to fall. It's upon us to be the watchmen on the wall, to be the ones to proclaim the truth of God. And Daniel, Daniel 6, the king commanded Daniel's brought into cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid at the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it. And with a signet, and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning him. <coughs> then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. And as he came to, near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in tones of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed you. Because I was found blameless before him. And also for you, O king, I have done no harm. So, in the face of trials, is God on your side? Is God willing to stand by you? Yes. Is the outcome sure? No. But he is with you. And you know your ultimate destination. In short, Stephen had his eyes on the goal. And the goal was Christ. And Christ was in heaven. The reason he is able to stand is because he had conviction. Conviction in his beliefs. Conviction that he was saying the right things. Conviction that he was saying at the right time to the right people. He also had truth. Next week, Sunday school. Starting off with truth. Truth is knowing what is real, not what we want it to be. But what is real? Where do we get the truth? Here. Society is making their own truth. That's a lie. Truth is not relative. It just is. <clears throat> confidence. He had the confidence that he knew. He was, he was not just a deacon. He was also a preacher. He knew his Bible. They didn't even have Bibles, but he knew the scrolls, he knew the Torah, and he was able to speak confidently of what he saw, the witness of Jesus Christ. And he spoke with confidence and authority, which is why they brought him to the Pharisees and Sadducees, because those who were accusing him on the street couldn't refute what he was saying. He was talking circles around. And he also had faith. He had faith that Jesus Christ was exactly who he said he was. That he had ascended to heaven, he had conquered them. And that, in the end, 
Whether now or later, Stephen knew, going into this, that he would one day be standing with Jesus Christ in heaven. All the sin, all the atonement had been paid for. He had that faith. He had that confidence. He was not worried about the future of death. Death was just a transition. In short, he had counted the cost. And what he was about to receive was far greater than anything he was about to lose. This brings us to the part where I remember several months ago that I was volunteered to do this in place of Pastor Sean because of Veterans Day. I think I had no idea what the passage was going to be at the time, but it lines up so well. All these men who stood up, they all, like me, had a point where they had that conviction the faith in the country, they believed that we were fighting the good fight at whatever point they joined. And like me, they stood and took an oath of office. I can solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear the true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to the regulations and the uniform code of military justice. So help me God. I haven't taken the last part off yet. Sometimes I wonder. I don't know the particulars of every person who served and how they came to that point or what they were thinking of. I do remember what I was thinking of at that time. I was thinking of the soldiers of the people who went before me, my forebears, who came to the country before it was the United States, some who fought with George Washington in the Battle of New York in the Revolution, a grandfather who was in World War II in the Navy in the Pacific, uncles who had been Marines in, during the Vietnam conflict, my father who was in the Army. I still hold on to his dog tags. And my brother hasn't quite come all the way in his faith journey. He's still working on it. But he was in the National Guard in high school. He, at the same time I was about to join the Coast Guard, was about to join the Navy and be a nuclear engineer. Sadly, cancer took that dream away from him. But he was willing to serve. And me, the Coast Guard, I didn't want to learn how to fight. I'll be honest, I wanted to save lives more than I wanted to take lives. I didn't even want to face that situation, but in the Coast Guard, I found a way to serve <laughs> and a way to help protect people. And we talk about veterans Day, but honestly, the firefighters, the law enforcement officers, the people who go to Berlin buildings, Knowing that it's their last act, but they have to try to save some more people. They all have the same conviction, the same belief. But then I had to ask myself, how does this tie to Stephen and Christianity today? And I found this writing by A.W. Tozer. The true follower of Christ will not ask, if I embrace this truth, what will it cost me? Rather, he will say, this is truth. This is truth. God, help me to walk in it. Let come what may. That is what it means to count the cost. Not to say, is it worth it? But to acknowledge what it may cost you and be willing to do it anyway. We talked about men going overseas to be missionaries and digging their grave before they leave, an acknowledgement of what the cost may be. It almost made me out of belief. I don't know if I'm there yet. I don't know if I've grown that strong in my faith. But there are people who have. So several years ago, when I was at Crossroads, and Christine and I had just been baptized. We had gone to church, yes. 
But we never really understood the true meaning of what it means to accept Jesus Christ. And we were baptized. And at first I became a small group leader, and later a deacon for a number of years. And I did a book study by Kyle Ivan called Not a Fan. Some of you may have seen that. I do still have book study. I'm always willing to do a small group study if people are interested in it. I also have the videos. But the essence of it is he is saying, are you a fan of Jesus Christ or are you a follower of Jesus Christ? And he relates in the beginning to a football game. You have all the fans in the stands dressed in their team's regalia, waving flags and shouting and whooping. And then, and then Monday morning, they're going to go to work and they're going to brag about how their team did well or make excuses why they didn't do so well. But are they a member of the team? When uh, the people were so up about the Buffalo Bills last year, and Buffalo Bills has always been my team if I had a team. This year, are they in, talking with such bravado? No, they're kind of hiding their heads. Same with the Giants. The point is, there are Christians who put bumper stickers on their vehicles. They turn on Caleb on their radio. They come to church one hour a week every Sunday. They put tithes into the offering. But are they truly followers? Are they really making the sacrifice? Have they acknowledged the truth, truly accepted Jesus Christ's sacrifice for them? Are you a follower of Christ? Do you have conviction in your beliefs? Or do you sometimes doubt? Do you ask God, I believe, help me in my belief, unbelief? Do you ask Him to help you in those moments of doubt? When someone dies, you ask, how could God let this happen? Do you believe in the truth of the gospel? Do you believe this is the literal word of God? I laughed this week listening to Congress. We have a Speaker of the House who is a Southern Baptist that served on the Commission of Religious Liberty. It's basically an ethics position. And they voted for him for Speaker of the House because they didn't know who he was. He's only been there for a few years. And now they've listened to him, they've researched him, and they said, we just jumped from the frying pan into the fire. This guy actually believes it. He is standing on his convictions, and he is playing 3D chess with these people like no one's business. He, is, he knows exactly what they are doing, and he is doing all the things they don't expect. That's because he believes in the truth. He has sound principles that he will not violate. Do you? Do you stand in the face of people who fight back against what's in the Bible and say, that can't be true, God loves me, he should accept me because I'm in a relationship that's a little loving partner, it may not be the partner he wants, but, oh, I can't have this baby. It'll just devastate me, it's too much of a financial risk. Any number of times. Are you having belief in the truth of the gospel that you're standing up for God's principles? Do you have confidence to be a witness? This is a hard one. When faced with someone you don't know and having to present the gospel, do you have the confidence to speak on his behalf? Do you remember that? Do not worry about what to say. I will give you the words. There is no person, you want to talk about paradise, there's no person I know in my life who does this better than my own wife. She's fearless, she's always looking, and when she sometimes turns away, God kicks her in the butt, turns her around. <laughs> Do you have faith in Christ Jesus? Do you honestly believe that he has paid all your sin and death, that you will go to heaven? that nothing can pluck you from the palm of his hand. No power or principality. There's nothing that will remove you once you set them from the palm of his hand. Because if you believe that, you have no reason to fear that. The only thing you have to fear is 
those people who have napped. <laughs> and you counted the costs. What they cost when they say you can't come to church anymore. When they say that you have to bow down to this God that we set up. I think about, at the end of this phrase, of this passage, I think, think about the last, next sentence immediately after this passage. And Saul approved the murder to kill him. And I think about him, not as Saul, but sometime later as Paul. And he writes this passage. And I think when he made this passage, he must have been thinking about Stephen and how he stood in the face of adversity. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Philippians 1.21. While we're here on this earth, we are to live as Christ did. We are to say the things Christ would say. We are to speak boldly and confidently. We are not to shirk away from adversity. And when we die, we will be with him. That's what I have for you this morning. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, this can be a heavy message because none of us are perfect. We all have doubts about our standing with you and our standing in the world and how we react, how we portray you to the world. If they don't know Christ, let them know him through me. It's something my wife says all the time. We always have to, we can't be Sunday Christians. We have to be Christians in the world at all times. We have to stand upright. And we have to do the things we're called to do now in your kingdom. And we have to reach out to those who are lost. We have to reach out to our family, friends, and neighbors. You can't say, I'll get to it someday, because someday <laughs> could be tomorrow. It could be in the next minute. Everything that needs to have been accomplished has been accomplished. You could come at any time, and then it is too late. So give us that will, give us that heart. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
if you're in the military, if you're in, uh, in the army, or whatever practice you are, and you're at war, and you do not know that you're at war, you will be killed real quick. Just remember that. We are at war every single day. Let's just take our inbox and turn to him. Five, nine, four.